Hey everybody! Hello. Welcome to WordCamp Jacksonville. Yes, awesome. It's the best WordCamp today, probably the best this month, maybe the best this year. Um, so my talk is the new styles, and so I just like, like I, I googled this I, I googled like bad, ugly fashion styles or something like that, and I found this picture. And then I tried to I tried to pair it with the equally gaudy font. And so this is what I came up with. So this is me. My name is Mike Herschel. I'm on the left. I have a dog and a daughter. And I work for a company called Lullabot. Lullabot is full service digital agency, all that stuff. We uh, do a lot of work for some large publishers. Like we've done stuff, well, we've done like MSNBC.com. We've done Grammys and a bunch of other cool stuff. I recently got a puppy. And the puppy's just like super cute. So. In the beginning, there was CSS. So, I, actually, I have I have some questions before we get started here. Who here uh, writes CSS? Who here like does like their own custom WordPress themes? Who here is just like sitting here hanging out? <laughs> most people, like for the record, for the video, most people are just hanging out. So, in the beginning, w w there was CSS, right? And we saw that it was good. You had your color, the fonts. Sometimes you would, you know, screw up your colors because you're using some type of color picker, and so you'd have some. Sometimes, sometimes you had to do this with your CSS. I actually installed Dreamweaver so I could take the screenshot. So you would do layouts with tables. And uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about a couple different things. The first thing I'm going to talk about is CSS variables. And you're probably thinking to yourself, well, what about SAS or LESS or something like that? Um, who here writes SAS or LESS or does some type of pre-processing? So what, what, uh, when, you, when you're writing your styles, um, you can write it in a certain syntax, in like indent stuff and nest stuff in your little brackets. And, and you can use you can use variables like this. So I can just say turquoise is is my background, and that'll resolve to some type of hexadecimal color. And then what when you're developing it, it will just like generate your CSS. You know, and your CSS of course is what tells your browser what things look like, right? So. You can use SAS or LESS to do this type of stuff, but it's a little bit different. I'm going to talk about that, right? So, flashback to 2010-ish, um, Nicole Sullivan used to work for, I believe, Yahoo at the time, and she created a, um, a specification uh, submission to add CSS variable support into, uh, into CSS. And so, Back forward to current time, or even 2015, you can see that all the major browsers really support this. Um, one of the reasons I'm talking about this is because it's not being used very, very often. I'm gonna, you know, we'll try and kind of maybe talk a little bit why. So, my, the kind of the meat and potatoes of this presentation is me talking about the different syntaxes why they're cool, how they work, and um, yeah, if, if anyone has any questions, or if I say something that's incorrect, you can throw something at me, or, or raise your hand. So, basic CSS properties right here. You can define your, so, I want to talk about it's custom properties, like if they're called CSS custom properties, a lot of people refer to them as CSS variables, but custom properties is a little bit more uh, easier to understand, right? Because when you're looking at like your CSS, um, your CSS selector and your uh, all your properties and stuff, this is the property, that's the value, or that's the rule, that's the value altogether, it's a property. So you're creating a custom uh, property right here, and then you're, you're assigning a value to it right here. So all custom properties are prefixed with just a double hyphen. 
And then when you want to uh, make use of this, it's pretty easy. You just have this bar function right here. And you just do bar, double hyphen, and whatever you call this. Does this kind of make sense at this point? You're looking at it, and like this is, this is kind of as basic, basic as it gets right here. But there's a couple uh, important things that you're probably looking at. You're probably like, what the hell is root? You know? So root is just the root of your document. It's the same thing as using, saying, like the HTML tag or something like that. That is pretty much always the HTML tag. Um, kind of like normal CSS, it will cascade down. So you know how, like, if you're if if you're styling your web page and you set the font to something like feature uh, like Arial or something like that, it will make the whole website that font. Right? If you set that right on your body tag, because the styles are cascading down, and so you're setting this um, custom property on like the HTML tag up here, and and it's setting that property all the way down. Um, if you set, you can also set your custom properties on like say a uh, an element down the DOM tree, say like an H3 or a class selector or something like that and the custom property will cascade down, but of course it doesn't cascade up, because that's the way CSS works. It's like, CSS is cascading, you know, that's one of the C's in CSS. Um, so, you can see what I'm doing right here is, um, I'm, I'm doing a hover state, right? So like a lot of times if you're doing a hover state, you say like background green, and then background, and then uh, you know, for your hover selector, you have background red or something like that, right? But you can do things like this right here, where you're changing the uh, variable at runtime as the browser is interpreting it. You're actually changing the variable, and this is like where the real power up comes into because this is something that you cannot do with SAS or less or any type of CSS preprocessing. So, like at this point, what we're doing is we are changing, uh, we are changing. <laughs> <laughs> we are changing this variable color only at hover, right? So we're not we're not editing the background, or we're not changing the background color. We're changing just the CSS variable, which of course is being called up there. Does that kind of make sense a little bit? So that so that carries on as as you go down, and unless you change it again, absolutely it sticks. Absolutely, yeah. Of course, this is just a hover state, so it only carries on as you're hovering. So exactly, yeah. Do they have like global variables or something you can't change or like constants? Yeah, so you can actually override them. I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. So like, just like a normal CSS uh, property, like say if I set, you know, my body background to red and then I set my, you know, uh, footer background to green, um, you can override it. So you can do the same with uh, CSS custom properties. You can also override it in line like this. And if you're doing like any type of like componentized CSS, um, like if you're doing, especially if you're using like React or something like that, you can like bind this stuff to your state, or you can um, you can edit this directly. Like uh, if you're doing, um, you, like obviously if you're doing like some type of server side rendering stuff like WordPress, you can output this stuff directly in your template files right there, and it will override any type of uh, default CSS that you have. So, like for example, you could have like uh, you know maybe a theme on your website for like different sections, right? And so I can say um, for for this part of my website, the theme is purple, and I can I can say my color. I can have something in like the head tag or something like that says dash dash color and says purple, and then all of the styles in the regular style sheet just look at that uh, custom property. Um, just gonna move on right here. Did I already do that? I already did that slide. Let's kind of look at a little bit more. So you can also um, have fallbacks right here. Maybe that's what I was talking about right here, yeah. So you can have a fallback value. So you can see there's two, um, two parameters being passed into the bar function right here. You have your color, but say if this is not defined, you can have a default right there. And the default of this case is just red. So, um, just to reiterate that, I like before we just had like the parentheses and just the one parameter being passed in, and this one you can set a default. Now what's kind of cool is you can set uh, for your default 
you can set that to another variable, right? So you can have your defaults be variables all the way down, and I created a meme for this. This is the highlight of the session. <laughs> so if you guys all want to leave now, it's okay. Um, yeah, so very, so all right, so if you're doing at supports, does anybody know what at supports does? So at supports is basically asking the browser, do you support this? You know, do you support CSS variables? Do you support CSS grid or something like that? And so you can actually detect support for this, or you, you're not actually detecting anything, you're just conditionally uh, throwing down your stuff based on that with this at supports up there. You don't have to remember all the syntax, just know it's, that it's possible, because you can always Google stuff after. You can set, um, of course, uh, values in here, like so six, 16 rem right here. Um, no, wait, this is what you cannot do. So this is a media query right here, right? So media, right now, as it stands, you cannot use CSS variables or CSS custom properties in media queries. Um, that's why they're called CSS custom properties. They're properties for down here. Um, there's a proposal in Chrome to get this working, but as of now, it's not working. So you still have to use things like SAS variables or less variables or just like hard code your media queries that way. So, um, what are we doing right here? <laughs> Animations, right? So you can animate. So. When you're doing CSS animations, you have your animation name, and your animation name uh, points to whatever keyframe that you're pointing, that, that, that you're, def you're defining the keyframe with the at keyframes, and then you point to that through animation name, right? So what you can do, um, and CSS variables kind of works with your animation, but it's a little bit funky, where you can animate two stuff, you know, like, so you can see, and, down here, I'm animating uh, from position left to position right. But you cannot animate a CSS custom property in here. You, like, you would think that that would kind of work, but it doesn't. Um, so just just be aware of that when you if you're doing CSS animations. And um, so here's kind of a complex example where what I'm doing is I'm, I'm setting, uh, I'm creating a div that kind of keeps uh, an aspect ratio, right? So there, there's a couple of different CSS hacks to do this, but like in this case, what I want is I want to, I want to create like, say like a box at a certain aspect ratio, whether it be narrow, wide, or something different. And based on the size of a custom property up here, I want to make it bigger or smaller, but I always want to keep the same uh, 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 the same aspect ratio. So you can see what I'm doing right here is I'm I'm using the CSS calc function. So CSS calc allows you to add like different units together. So you can add like things like pixels with percentages, with BW units, and everything else. So what I'm doing right here is I'm just basically using the CSS custom property and timesing it by um, whatever the aspect ratio that I want right here is, which in this case is 16 by 9. And then I want to add a, uh, a unit on it, so I'm just going to add rems. So that's, that's the width. And then, of course, you can do the height. You can do your font size based on that. And, of course, the background is just pointing to that. So basically, I have three CSS properties up here keying off of one uh, CSS variable, and that's pretty cool. Um, kind of makes sense? Does everybody understand what I'm doing? Yeah. Yeah. Mike, yeah. You, you always use uh, two arguments in what uh, function? Is it required? No. No, nope. you only need one. Uh, you, you only need the one uh, argument in there, like the uh, custom property name. Um, in this case, I'm setting my default value just to one, a size of one. Okay. Yes. Sir. Yeah. Okay. So this is a like this is a more advanced use case right here, but I just kind of want to show it because that's something that's pretty cool. So next thing I really want to talk about is CSS grid, right? So CSS. Let's recap this. Has anyone used CSS variables? Before? Is anybody going to use CSS variables? You haven't used it. Anybody going to use it? 
Pretty easy, pretty cool. Mm -hmm. You kind of gave like a that. I'm gonna. We'll, we'll see. He'll we'll see. Yeah. No. <laughs> They're pretty cool. So, someone like elbow that guy. <laughs> so I'm gonna talk about CSS Grid right now. So CSS Grid is uh, a new way to basically lay out all your all your data on your page, right? So if if you remember back in like the 1990s, you would use <coughs> table-based layouts. In the, in the early 2000s, you would use table-based layouts where you would, you know, create your TRs, TDs, and you would put a, like a little TD over here, put an image in it, and put a T, TD over here, and you'd put your H1 in it and stuff like that. And then sometimes stuff would collapse weird, so you put like spacer GIFs in there and all types of cool stuff. And then sometimes you had to like nest your tables to kind of keep stuff. <laughs> and it was uh, pretty cool. So back in uh, like, I don't know, 2003, 2005, I, you, started using, you started using floats, right? So you would float to the left, float to the right, you'd set your widths, you know, and then you would have to use clear, you know, so like a lot of times you, like, you would float something right, float something left or something like that, but then the container div would not go all the way down to the bottom and you're like what the hell is going on you don't know what a clear <laughs> fix is pain in the butt because floats were not made for positioning <coughs> so then you had like all these grid systems you know so you had stuff like I remember like I think 960 was one of the first grid systems to come out and basically you would just uh, stick a CSS file in your theme and you you could put CSS classes on there, you know, like span four, grid twelve, and stuff like that. And that's honestly how Bootstrap works. A lot of people use Bootstrap, but you had this proliferation of grid systems. And uh, you know they would create stuff like this. They would create like all these, you know, weird margins. You're looking in developer tools. You're like, what the hell is all these, you know, decimal points? I don't like decimal points. And then you would see stuff like this. You would find articles that say the 13 best responsive CSS grid systems. Like this is, in my opinion, like a little bit idiotic because I don't want to learn a grid system just to make a website. I just want stuff to work. I, I, I want to. I don't want to spend my time learning something new just so I can lay out stuff on a website. You know, and I made another meme. <laughs> so you got uh, CSS grid, right? So CSS grid is, is is pretty new. It's meat and potatoes of the website or of my presentation again, and. Um, so, CSS Grid is pretty easy. So, uh, a couple of show hands here. Who has heard of CSS Grid? Who has used CSS Grid? Who has your, like used Flexbox? <coughs> CSS Grid is a lot easier than Flexbox, but it is something additional to learn. That's pretty awesome. Um, all the examples are, are going to be using like kind of markup similar to this, right? So when you're laying out your your HTML, you just basically have your wrapping element, your container that has, you know, your grid laid out, and then just a bunch of stuff underneath. And at that point, you can tell it what to do, right? So the first thing we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about the different uh, CSS properties that you can throw in your grid parent up there. I created a um, a bunch of like code pens that you can screw around with at herschel.com slash grid links and oh man you know what I, I'm not mirroring my display how do I get this over there there we are so you can see if you like I have like a bunch of code pen links and stuff like that and you can just start screwing around with stuff like right here and the best, the best way, of course, to um, to learn anything is to do it. So, if you want to start screwing around, that's a good place to start. So, when you're doing CSS grid, the the first thing that you do is on the parent container, you just say display grid. It's pretty easy, right? But like you want to put in some columns, right? So like say if I have, I want three columns in this grid. Well, that's pretty easy. I can do this uh, property to grid template columns and 200 pixels three times. So at this point, I have my parent container, knows it's a grid. 
and I know there's three columns in here, 200 pixels, 200 pixels, and 200 pixels. Pretty straightforward, right? So if you start like throwing stuff in there, it's going to start throwing stuff in that column right now. You can do the same with rows. Like, so you can do like 200, 200, 200 with rows, or you can do auto, auto, auto. Auto just makes the rows uh, conform to however big the content is. So by default right here, you're going to have three rows. Um, you can also have your grid like automatically add rows and stuff, which it will do by default. So this will set up. Uh, so we're changing, we're changing the syntax a little bit. So instead of grid template rows and grid template columns, we're going to use this grid template. So at this point, we have four 50 pixel rows, three 200 pixel columns, right? So you can imagine how that would look like in a table right there. It would, you know. 450 pixel rows, three 200 pixel columns. It's pretty straightforward. You can kind of uh, change around the syntax a little bit, and you can see in this case we're using the repeat function right here. And so at this point, you're going to do three 200 pixel columns, right? Pretty straightforward. Um, you can also uh, mix and match them right here. Mix and match? Yeah, mix and match them, sure. So at this point, I have one 300 pixel column and then three 200 pixel columns in that order. Does that make, kind of make sense? So you're typically going to want some gaps in between your columns and your rows and stuff like that, or stuff will be butting right up against each other. <coughs> when you're doing Flexbox, you typically use margins or padding or you're justifying stuff in a certain way. Um, within CSS Grid, you can set the gaps uh, to whatever values you want, you, using whatever units you want. This is kind of cool, because I don't know if anybody ever used like grid systems like SUSE and stuff like that. It was always a real pain in the butt to use pixel-based uh, gutters, um, as opposed to um, percentage-based and stuff like that. It was tough to mix and match them. So this is pretty straightforward. You under, like obviously the gap between the columns and the rows. So looking at this right here, we have we have a min max function here. I'm gonna we'll talk about this. So of course we have the first column is 200 pixels. Then we have three columns, and the three columns is doing this thing, which is min max 100 and 200. And the min, what the min max does is it sets the minimum and maximum. It just makes the um, column width right there kind of a little bit variable. So this will slide in between 100 and 200 pixels depending on the content and depending on the width of the container and stuff like that. Does that kind of make sense? I'm kind of going from like, I don't know, 10 miles an hour to right now we're probably going a, a good 40, but we're going to get up to probably like 60 or 70. We're talking, so the next thing, there's a new unit right here called the FR unit. So you know how like in CSS you can, you can specify stuff through pixels, you can specify stuff through M's, you can specify stuff through REMs. Um, I think there's probably a couple others, like you have viewport units like VW's, which you can, percentage of your width of your browser and your height of your browser. Well now you have FR units, and FR stands for fraction. So basically, um, what it does is it adds up all of the FR units that are in your row, and then it, it'll divide those. So like, how can I explain this? So say if there's like four FR units, that means each one is 25 percent. If there's five FR units, each one's twenty percent. If there's six FR units, I don't know. At that point, we're down to like eighteen-ish percent or something like that. But it automatically handles all that math for you, so you don't have to use any type of math. And so basically it just makes it one unit. But if you have, say, um, you know, if you have, a, if you have a column, take, and you set this column to two FR units, and then you have another one, you have two columns that are each one FR unit. Your two FR units are going to take up 50%, and each of the one FR units are going to be 25%. Kind of makes sense-ish? Does anybody... Uh, uh, understanding that? Alright, I have a couple. So yeah. Um, 
So you have autofill in here. So basically what it will do, it almost looks like an equal sign, but it's a hyphen. Um, you can see I have this grid up here. Um, I have an explicit width. I'm setting, I'm setting this container to a width of 1,000 pixels. And I'm repeating autofill, so I don't have a value there. I'm not repeating three 200 pixels, I'm repeating autofill. The autofill will fill as many as it can fill in there, right? So at this point, I can look at this and I can say, well, there's two, there are 200 pixels. How many times, how many columns are going to go in there? And the answer would be five. So what's kind of cool is you can do uh, autofill and min max and FR units, right? So what this, what this will do is this will take your grid container and it will all the, when you set your min max to two, to like a pixel base value in an FR unit, what it will do is it will always uh, take up the full width of your grid container. You know, so a lot of times if you're defining your grid, you might have like an extra 50 pixels over to the right or 25 pixels and that will make the layout look all funky. This will, because you're using min max right here and you have it set to FR units, this will automatically fill up that remaining space. So it will always take up all your columns or rows or whatever you're doing there, it will always take up that full amount. And that's pretty cool for layout stuff. <coughs> auto rows and auto columns just basically auto generate the columns. Um, I think you can specify, yeah, you specify the height. Um, and so this is kind of cool right here. Um, <coughs> masonry layout. So let me kind of maybe show an example of this right here. Let's see if I can get back to Chrome. No, escape out of this. So you see like right here, I have my CSS grid, kind of, can I scroll up and down, yeah. I have, my, I have my grid created right here. And I have a number of like different like little elements in here. This one is set, is probably taking up, you know, this one's definitely taking up two columns, this one's taking up two rows. And the thing is like when, when grid lays these out, of course it puts these in source order, you know. So if I scroll to the top up here, this one's obviously first in the source order, then this, then this, then this. And it puts these gaps in here, you know, which is normal. That's kind of what you would expect and that's what you would want. But you can use this um, property in here called grid autoflow dense. See if I can uh, come in. And what it will do is it will change, it, it'll, it'll kind of allow the browser to push things a little bit out of source order and just make stuff fit, right? So there's like cool, cool uh, there's some JavaScript libraries I used to do this with, like the most common one was called jQuery Masonry, and there's a couple other ones just like Packery, there's probably like 29 of them because it's, you know, JavaScript, jQuery libraries. So basically like you can lay out cool stuff like this, and look at that, there's no JavaScript. You know, because there's no JavaScript, it's also really fast to lay out. You don't have that flash of on style content and all that type of stuff. It's pretty cool, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, let me get my water. So yeah, it's pretty neat. I think we're doing pretty good on time. But we still have the grid child syntax. So we talked about all those items that were on the parent item. All those properties were on that like grid container item. But now we have all the items that are on that grid child, all the divs that are nested underneath of that, right? So at this point, um, we're going to use justify content and uh, align items and what we can do is we can align these tracks so like say at this point right here I have a width of 1000 pixels right but I only have three 300 pixel columns in here 
So at that point, you're going to have like that extra 100 pixels. Is that 100 pixels going to go at the end, at the beginning? Is it going to be in the middle of 50 pixels on each side? Um, by default, it's going to it'll be at the end right here. But you can you can say I want I want to justify all this content to the end, and you can say I want to align the items. Align is vertical, right? I want to align the items at, at the end. So like so, let's say in this case, if we have you know a, a width where there's some leftover area and the height where the rest leftover areas, this will move all the columns and and rows that you have to find to the bottom right. So you can do cool stuff like that. So like let's say in this case right here, <coughs> I want to have my a particular grid child. And I don't want this to I don't want this to go on the first column, I want it to go on the second column for whatever reason. It's pretty easy right here, grid column start two. Um, and you can have it span multiple columns. So you can say grid column end span two. So you, if you have, you, so in this case right here, we have grid column start two and grid column end span two. So what that's going to do, obviously, it's going to start on the first column, and then it's just going to go over two. It's going to cover all the gaps, and it's just going to kind of magically work. Work. Um, you can do the same thing right here. But instead of doing span two, you can say grid column end four. So at this point, it's always going to end on column four instead of spanning two. You know, um, in this particular use case, it's going to uh, show the exact same thing, right? Here's a little bit of shorthand: two, four, right? So you got grid column start is in this case is two. Grid column end is going to be four. So it's going to do the same thing as up here, where it's going to start in the second column, go to four. And you can use spans in here. Kind of makes sense for child elements? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Everybody else can screw off. <laughs> um, yeah, so we have it spanning multiple rows, putting it into a multiple row. So at this case, you can see right here, um, you see where I said group column in and I have a negative value right there? When you're so like if you do grid column start one, it's going to start in the first column. If you're re referencing a negative number, it's always going to start from the end. So this is pretty cool. So like at that point, what I can do, <coughs> I can do grid column one slash negative one, and this will always take up the full the full row. And this is pretty neat because even if you change around like your uh, your grid tracks like. Your, your number of columns, which you might be doing in a media query. Like, for example, like at a narrow width, you might have six columns, and at a, at a wide width, you might have 12 columns. But for whatever reason, you always want this particular div, or whatever it is, to span the full width. Well, you can just do grid column one slash negative one, instead of like redeclaring, you know, span 12 or whatever you're gonna do. Kind of cool? Yeah, I think we already did that one right there. So you, in this case right here, where we have it, and we have the, we have this item right here, starting on the second uh, column, and then taken up to taking two two columns beyond that. So now, <clears throat> everything I showed you right there is like what you need to get started. This stuff right here <coughs> gets a little funky, and honestly, it gets like kind of complicated pretty quick. So, um, but I want, like, I, I want to make sure that you're familiar with it because, especially if you're looking at other people's code, and you're like, what the hell are these square brackets doing in my grid syntax and stuff like that? Like, this doesn't make sense. So, let's kind of uh, talk about what these are. So these are called named lines right here, when you put these square brackets in here. And so, like, imagine... Um, in this case right here, we have a grid, and it's just one column wide, right? And, but imagine, like, as you're separating the columns, you have these imaginary lines on each side, you know, at the, be at the very beginning, and in between each one, and at the very end. Ten minutes remaining. Thank you, sir. So, these lines, you can name them, and then refer to them later. So, in this case right here, um, 
I have my, I, I have this, oh, I have my doing right here, grid, grid template column. So I, I have my content start and content end. So I can move these content starts and content ends within the media queries, right? And so I have my child right here, and my child say, well, I'll, I'll always start on content start. So what happens right here is, no, I don't have a media query for the, for the grid child, but I'm moving around the content start within the parent grid. So this will autom like so that means the grid child will start to uh, write on the first column with uh, by default, and then for anything above 700 pixels right here, it'll start on the second column. Kind of makes sense. It's a little complicated at this point. So basically, you're naming the lines. You can re you can refer to these abstract named lines. And then you can change around the position of those lines within your media queries, and everything will just kind of follow and work. So just remember that's possible, and if you see someone doing it, then you know how to troubleshoot it. So it gets a little more complicated than that. You have what's called named areas. So in this case right here, so this is kind of cool. I can actually set up my grids by doing stuff like this right here. So I'm, I'm setting up like a grid, I'm, I'm using this property called grid template areas. I have my header going two columns, I have my sidebar going one column on row two, my content over here, and then footer going two columns. So your browser will look at this type of stuff, and will see the, like the strings and everything like that, and it'll say, all right, well this is uh, two columns, three rows, and since these are exactly the same, this is spanning two row, or two columns, and it'll automatically like figure that type of stuff out, right? And so at this point, you can change the position of these named areas based on your media queries. And then what's really cool is you can put your header always in the header, right? So I can say header will always go into header, a side will always go into sidebar, main will always go into content, and footer will always go into a footer right here. I don't have to use media queries up on these child elements. I can use all my media queries when defining the grid. So, like, in this case, the aside for small widths will always go below the content. The aside for these tablet widths will go to the left of the content, but below the footer and above, uh, below the header and above the footer. And the aside for, uh, very, for larger widths will take up two, two rows, but only one column, and then everything else will flow. It's kind of cool. A little bit complicated, but kind of cool. What's the, I'm sorry, um, what's the media query of the 700 where it says, why is header next to header? Like, why are they? Because header is spanning two, uh, two rows. Gotcha. I mean, yeah, two columns, I mean. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you can see down here we have content also spanning. Um, so right here, you can see that this is empty. And if, huh. I would like, I, you know what, I, I, was, I was about to lift it up like this, <laughs> and then I realized that wasn't going to work. Um, so if you can see down here, there's like a little dot in this space. If, if there's a dot there, that means it's an empty area. So like say like if I'm defining my stuff like this, and I want uh, this grid column in a row to always be empty, I put a dot there. Kind of make sense? Grid template shorthand. Man, this is like something from like a long time ago. My slides are meant to be out of order. Oh, yeah. So, all right. This right here is probably the most complicated syntax I've seen. Um, so this is valid syntax, and you're looking to yourself, and you're probably thinking like, Mike, what the hell is this stuff? Why would people want to do this and put it in their code? Because it's really confusing. Especially, imagine if all this was on like one line, if it was like minified and put on one line, you'd be like, what the hell is going on? So, what we have is we have the named areas to the left over here, and these named areas, of course, are making the, the head area go uh, full width, and then we have like some side one, side two regions. And then over here, we are doing rows and then columns, right? So in this case, we have 200 pixels rows, and we have uh, 300 pixels repeat. Uh, we have four, a total of four columns right here. We have three 1FR columns, 
and one 300 pixel columns. And you can define all those in just grid template. Thank you, sir. And uh, yeah, that's, a, that's, that's something that I would uh, not be doing just because I, I like my code to be readable, but it's just possible. So you could, you could totally use CSS grid right now. Um, it's supported in all the major, all the major browsers. <laughs> it, is, um, it is not supported, of course, by Internet Explorer 11. So if you're still supporting Internet Explorer 11, you have to use fallbacks, right? Um, but honestly, it's not terribly difficult to do that. Uh, so, the uh, the most recent project I'm working on, I'm finally using CSS Grid, so it feels pretty good to do that. Uh, yeah, you can see IE11. IE11 does support it in a limited way. It supports like a really funky syntax of it, and honestly, it's kind of worthless. Shocking. Do you yeah, use, no. Do you use Flexbox to fall back, or do you use something else? It depends. You know, a lot of times, like, yeah, Flexbox, widths, auto margins, just w whatever, normal stuff. And honestly, uh, that's really about it right there. I got through my slides. So, so this slide right here, I Googled thank you and took a screenshot, and that's what it is. <laughs> um, anyway, all right. <laughs> questions on all of this, since we have uh, about three minutes and 10 seconds. Like, Mike, what do you think about this? <laughs> yes, Kyle. What do you think about omni-channel blockchain? <laughs> <laughs> well, in the, uh, I, I think it promotes a synergy and out-of-the-box thinking for a uh, you know, world that where people Buzzwords. have uh, thought leadership. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. Yes. All right, so that's it. Thank you. Thank you.